good evening and welcome to bookmark for the last one month or maybe a month and a half kerala has been enjoying if that's a word to use bright sunshine and excessive heat and people are already wondering what kind of summer we are going to have not to mention you know december and january which is technically winter but which could be a problem for us particularly from the point of view of the availability of water i will start by introducing two books which examines these questions and the books are really well written and well thought out there's a good historical background and very practical solutions are offered the books are the climate solution india's climate change crisis and what we can do about it by mrudula ramesh the second book is this book also by murudula ramesh and it is titled watershed how we destroyed india's water and how we can save it you can't think of two books that are more topically important than these i strongly recommend them and i believe that the book that we are going to examine today is not directly but subtly connected to these Indians we know have great self regard for themselves i read a report about a pure report on india and indians today which said that unlike other people in the world not like everyone else but like a lot of other people in the world indians have extremely high self regard not always shared by people in other countries you know uh, we think that we are the most important or one of the most important nations in the world but in large swaths of the world they are not even aware of what india is doing sad but that's a fact of life now the book that we are going to examine today is one that should make these indians who are extremely proud of their own civilization even happier than they might have been uh, before they knew about these ideas that are present in the book which is the book it is this skepticism in indian thought charvaka philosophy reexamined it's by a lady called latika chatobadhyay i'd never heard of her i'd never heard of any other book she had written this book came out a few years ago i happened to be in a bookshop where i found this and i went through the contents read a couple of pages and liked it and i picked it up and i'm extremely happy that i read this particular book because it led me to a few other books on the same on the same topic besides apart from the other books this is an excellent introduction to the materialistic thinking of philosophy that was alive and flourishing in india for close to a thousand years roughly from about say 5 or 6 or 6 or 7 uh, centuries before the birth of christ till about the 14th of the 15th century that's a long period this particular philosophy which is loosely called charvaka philosophy or materialist philosophy did not really flourish but there were a number of thinkers who belonged to it and they have made an immense contribution i believe not just to indian civilization but to thought and philosophy across the world and it is something that we need to understand we need to be able to celebrate and tell the world look these were people in india who thought along these very sophisticated lines 1000 or nearly 2500 years ago and these are some lines of thinking that even today's science is just about beginning to touch if you ask indians what is great about their culture or civilization most ordinary indians would say it is the world's most spiritual civilization and everybody seems to think that we are the most spiritual people in the world i think even people outside india will agree that indians are within quotes spiritualists but i think that the essence of india does not lie in spirituality alone look at what indians have achieved throughout history they have built great empires they have built great cities starting with mohenjodaro and so on they had a population that is now the world's biggest 
which meant that they were able to feed and house and look after these thousands or millions of people without much difficulty. They had all the sciences and techniques and knowledge necessary for it. And almost all of it was indigenous. It came from our own land. They mastered the art of domesticating agriculture, you know, which meant basically domesticating certain plants so that they would supply us with food. They mastered the art of domesticating animals from animals like the elephant to the hen so that they would be useful to us. They built great cities. They built wonderful systems of irrigation so that our monsoon dependent land could sustain this huge population. This meant that they would have tanks and dams and canals and that they would supply people with water throughout the year. These are great feats of any civilization. And Indians did this with great style and aplomb. They built wonderful cities. Think of a structure like our great temples in, in the south or, or in Khajuraho and so on. Think of the engineering, the craftsmanship that was needed to erect so if you look at all of that, if you look at the cities and the armies and all the systems in place, you will understand that we had a material culture which was basically supported by an army of artisans and craftsmen and masons and people of, with all kinds of talents, you know, metallurgists did their work, weavers did their work and so on and so forth. We had a rich material civilization. We sometimes forget this in our quest to say that we are the most spiritual people in the world. That spirituality came on top of this, on top of all the things that we had achieved as a material culture, something that we can be immensely proud of. So from sophisticatedly designed cities to such wonderful works, as the Arthashastra and the Kama Sutra. Classical India produced all of this. And if they produced this, you can be sure that behind it were a set of philosophical ideas that supported it. And it is those ideas that we are going to look at when we look at the book that we are examining today, which is Ledika Chattopadhyay's Skepticism in Indian Thought, Charvaga Philosophy Reexamined. Not much is known about the group of thinkers that Indians refer to as Charvaga. There probably wasn't an individual called Charvaga, although there are some candidates. But there was a loosely coherent school to which we apply the name. And they had some core ideas. And I'll tell you what those core ideas are. Number one, the Charvagas, unlike mainstream Indian philosophy, did not believe in the presence of a soul. You wear your body, that's it. Nothing else existed. Then, they did not believe in another world. They did not believe, for example, that you would die and be reborn somewhere else or that there was a heaven to which you could go or maybe a hell you were destined to reach. No, there was only one world and it was this world in which we were living. A third idea that they had was that if we wanted knowledge about the world, it was possible only through one source. And that source was perception. Our sense organs tell us things about the world and from that we have to proceed. In other words, they were rejecting the authority of gurus or rishis or prophets and so on. They said, all knowledge comes from our senses. Then, it also meant, this is another core idea of the Charvagas, that they did not accept any scripture. And in India, that meant basically rejecting the Vedas. If you reject the Vedas, naturally, you also reject the priests, who are the kind of middlemen between the uttered words of the rishis or the gods or God and ordinary citizen. Voltaire is supposed to have said during the European Enlightenment that the first priest was the first rogue who met the first fool. That idea was not put in exactly those words, but that was an idea present in India roughly 2,500 years ago. They had one more core idea, and it was that 
reason should be the only guide of human beings so built around these core ideas you will be surprised at how many different schools of charvakas there were the core ideas seem pretty solid and stable but even then there were great disputes among the charvakas and all the other people from all the other schools dislike the charvakas immensely and attack them all the time so one of the strange thing about the charvakas is that there is no single text we can refer to if there was one that's disappeared we just have quotations from the charvakas and these come from the works of those who are refuting the charvakas now isn't it extremely astonishing that the only knowledge we have of perhaps the most influential school of indian philosophy are stray quotations they must have been powerful indeed if those stray quotations alone are enough for us to be able to build up a philosophy and to infer or the inference is not something that some charvakas like that this was a philosophy that molded indian life across the centuries the charvaka schools themselves were very diverse at one extreme you had a set who did nothing but dispute you know they are a little like the deconstructionists of the 20th century you give them any statement they would dispute it and they would dispute it with logic that was very very hard to refute but the negative side of that is that they had nothing positive to say they could dismantle any system but they couldn't really build up a system so that it was not very far from being a nihilistic school so there was on the one hand such a school at another extreme you have a school that seemed to be similar to the greek school of the stoics now the stoics were people who believed that life had to be faced with courage and wisdom and knowledge and there were similar thinkers in india and you had lots in between but one thing that happened to the charvakas was that because they did not believe in an afterlife or in what is sometimes in india called dharma or fate what they did was to believe that pleasure was the only good which makes them in a sense epicureans now the epicureans of ancient greece were not just licentious pleasure seekers they were people who believed in moderation above everything else who believed that pleasure was a good and possibly the only good but who also believed in moderation now what happened in india was that a set of charvakas came to be associated with licentiousness and pleasure seeking and that led to the idea that they would seek pleasure at any cost soon the label amoral or immoral came to be placed on these charvakas the pleasure seekers and that has hurt not just that particular group but all charvakas one of the things you find is that even buddhists and jains who initially seem to have certain things in common with uh, charvakas began to disown them and to attack them very very fiercely it is not only because they were opposed to the vedas and to the idea of reincarnation and so on but also because of this excessive focus on pleasure and nothing else which some charvakas were guilty of what letika chatobadhyay does and does brilliantly is to look at every reference to the charvakas in classical indian literature beginning with the ramayana and the mahabharata down to works in the 14th and 15th century and from them telling us what point of view was attacked if a particular point of view was attacked she will tell us this must have been what that point of view meant and she will talk about the ethical implications of that and sometimes the implications it has for political philosophy or for your theory of knowledge and so on so she does that effortlessly you don't have to be a student of philosophy to understand her arguments it's a pleasure reading through this book and understanding what the contributions of this great set of indian thinkers was to our civilization i would strongly recommend that you read levika chatobadhyay's skepticism in indian thought charvaka philosophy reexamined when i read levika chatobadhyay's book i was filled with a sense of happiness and being able to understand the contribution of these wonderful set of thinkers but i was also filled with a sense of loss i thought 
if only this wide variety of schools were allowed to flourish if only they could reach their logical evolution and ending india would have developed in a very different manner who knows india may even have been the place where experimental science developed we know that it developed in europe and we have been catching um, you know we have been trying to catch up with them ever since but if you look at the charvagas in india you think here was a golden opportunity wasted now in order to understand all of this i would recommend some of the books as well number 1 a fabulous book on indian history this is namit arora's work indians a brief history of a civilization he begins with the indus valley and ends in fairly contemporary times lovely book it is a book that you can read as a background to understanding the contribution of the charvagas the next book i want to recommend is actually on the charvagas it is a little more technical and philosophical work but you don't need a training in philosophy to understand it lovely work it is pradeep p gokhale and his book is titled lokayada charvaga a philosophical inquiry it's a little more detailed than ladiga chatobadia's book but it will reward you by providing you with a lot of information on all the aspects of charvaka thinking my last book that i will recommend today is a book again which will help us understand the charvagas because we will understand the historical background very well i recommended namita arora now here let me recommend upindra singh and her wonderful work ancient india culture of contradictions and that will give you the background to the atmosphere or the ethos in which the charvagas lived and worked and were abused and pushed underground we need to reach back and understand the spirit of the charvagas i believe if india is to take its rightful place among the nations of the world so read about the charvagas understand what they had to say and if you think so embrace their philosophy and become a prouder indian thank you very much